sixth commandment says, Thou shalt not kill. And here we have the Heidelberg Catechism's interpretation of that commandment in Lord's Day 14. What doth God require in the sixth commandment? That neither in thoughts, nor words, nor gestures, much less in deeds, I dishonor, hate, wound, or kill my neighbor, by myself or by another, but that I lay aside all desire of revenge. Also, that I hurt not myself, nor willfully expose myself to any danger. Wherefore also the magistrate is armed with the sword to prevent murder. But this commandment seems only to speak of murder. In forbidding murder, God teaches us that he abhors the causes thereof, such as envy, hatred, anger, and desire of revenge, and that he accounts all these as murder. But is it enough that we do not kill any man in the manner mentioned above? No, for when God forbids envy, hatred, and anger, he commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to show patience, peace, meekness, mercy, and all kindness towards him, and prevent his hurt as much as in us lies, and that we do good even to our enemies. Thou shalt not kill, says God's law. Have you ever murdered anyone? Now if I were to ask that question on the streets of Limerick this morning, have you ever murdered anyone? Most people, if not all people, would say, of course not. I would never murder anyone. Let me, however, ask a few different questions. Have you ever wished ill upon someone? And have you ever expressed that ill will in words or in deeds? Have you ever, in anger, written a nasty email to someone, or a text message, or posted something on Facebook to make it very contemporary today? Have you ever been angry without a cause against someone, irritated by what they have done to you? For example, they spent too much time in the bathroom. And so you curse them under your breath. Or they didn't tidy up after themselves and that made you annoyed with them. Have you ever cursed in anyone even under your breath? Have you ever been annoyed with a teacher, for example, who gave you too much homework? Or have you been irritated by your spouse for something he or she did to you? Or by a sibling? Or have you ever held a grudge against someone and refused for a time to forgive that person and harbored bitterness in your heart? All of those are examples, according to the Bible, of murder. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, includes more than simply not shooting someone, or stabbing them, or strangling them, or poisoning them, or any other method of murder that you might choose. Jesus made that very clear in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount. He identified unlawful anger as murder, and hatred as murder. And in 1 John chapter 3, we read of those who are not of God. Verse 10. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Not loving your brother makes you a murderer, even if you do not actively hit your brother. And verse 15 says, Whosoever hitteth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And the example given to us in 1 John chapter 3 is Cain, and he was the first murderer. 
In fact, Cain's sin is the first recorded sin after the fall itself. And Cain's calling was not simply not to murder his brother Abel. His calling was to love his brother Abel. His calling was also to be his brother Abel's keeper. Remember his question to God. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain thought, I'm not my brother's keeper. In fact, he was wrong. He was his brother's keeper. His calling was to watch out for Abel and to protect him as much as lay in him. And that's our calling too toward our neighbours according to the sixth commandment. We are to watch out for him and to prevent his hurt as much as in, it, in, in us lies and to promote his welfare and to preserve his life and to refrain from harming him in any way. And why are we called to do that as Christians? Out of thankfulness to God, who preserves our life, and who saved our life from going down into the pit of hell itself, and who gave the life of his own Son in the place of our life, so that we would be delivered and brought into eternal blessedness. And so, says 1 John 3, verse 16, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, because he laid down his life for us. That's really the calling of the sixth commandment. Not simply do not murder, it's a calling toward our neighbor's life. Our calling toward our neighbor's life. Notice first the principles behind this <laughs> commandment, then the prohibition, what is forbidden, and then the command, what is actually positively commanded. We have said before, as we've looked at the Ten Commandments, that the Ten Commandments are rooted, really, in the character of God Himself. He is the lawgiver, and we would expect, therefore, His law would reflect something of the lawgiver. And it does. The Sixth Commandment is given to us because God is sovereign. He is in control of all things. He rules over all things, including, and especially in this connection, life and death itself. God, not you, not me, not any creature, is sovereign over life and death. And that's why he gives us the sixth commandment, Thou shalt not kill. Each man and woman comes into this world, spends a certain period of time in this world, and leaves this world according to the sovereign purpose and determination of God. There are no accidents. It's not that some people shouldn't be here because of an accident. It's not that some people die before their time. We hear of that people dying before their time. In fact, that's not true. No one really dies before his or her time. God alone knows how long or how short a person's life will be. And more than that, God has determined how long or short a person's life shall be. That's clearly taught in Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, verse 26. And God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And notice, and hath determined the times before appointed and the vines of their habitation. So God hath determined the times, how long a person will live, and the vines of their habitation, where a person will live. That's not determined by you, it's not determined by me. And for some, God has determined a long life. Some people have lived for hundreds of years. Think of the Old Testament, people lived for hundreds of years. Other people have a shorter 
life. And for some, they don't even get to see the beginning of life outside of the womb. God takes them, even in their earliest infancy, from their mother's womb. But the murderer says, in effect, I do not believe that God is sovereign over life and death. I believe that I have a say in when I or my neighbor should live or die. And that, of course, is rebellion against God, the law giver. We do not have power or authority over our life or the lives of any other person. We may not determine for ourselves when we shall live and when we shall die, nor may we determine that for any other person. And our society has lost sight of this. Our society increasingly is saying this. We should have the right to choose when a person lives and when a person dies. Whether that be an unborn child in the womb, or an old person whom society says has now lived past his cell by date and past his usefulness, it would be better for him and for society if that person were removed from society. But we cannot and may not determine that for ourselves. And if we try to, we are really saying, I am God. I will play God. First Samuel chapter 2 verse 6 is the rejoicing of Hannah after God opened her womb. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. And since God is sovereign over life and death, when he takes a person's life in death, he is not guilty of murder. He has the right to end a person's life. We, as creatures, do not. And when we do, we become guilty of murder. God's sovereignty also includes this. It is his purpose to place each individual person, your neighbor and mine, in our lives according to his own will. And he commands us to love our neighbors. Those are the people he puts in our lives. All the people with whom you and I rub shoulders are there according to the sovereign purpose of God. Not by accident, but by God's sovereign will and providence. Our neighbor is our spouse or our children, our fellow church member, the person who lives next door to us where we live, our fellow student in the classroom or our teacher or anyone else who crosses our path in our daily life. God has given those neighbors to us and says to us, love those neighbors even when those neighbors are unpleasant and nasty people. And our calling is to seek our neighbor's good, and especially his spiritual good. Our calling is to promote our neighbor's welfare, and in terms of the sixth commandment, to protect him from harm. The problem, however, with neighbors is this. They become very close to another person, they encroach upon our life and they cause things to happen in our life that we do not like. In a word, they get in our way. Neighbors have a tendency to get in our way, to get in the way of what we want to do and to get in the way of our pleasure and our fun and our financial advancement and so on. Some neighbors even cause us misery and pain. And our natural tendency is to seek to get rid of those neighbors. 
And the most extreme way of getting rid of a neighbor is to murder that neighbor. If you read any detective novels, you will see that murderers usually, if not always, have a motive. And the motive really boils down to this. The victim stands in some sense in the way of the murderer. Perhaps the victim must die so that the murderer can inherit that person's money. There's a motive for murder. Perhaps the victim is threatening or blackmailing the murderer, and so the murderer has to get rid of that person. There's also a motive for murder. There's always a motive, or at least almost always a motive, because the neighbor gets in the way of my happiness, and so I must get rid of him, if not by actual murder, by hating him, by being envious toward him, by making his life miserable, by doing evil to him. God also forbids murder because murder is against his very character. He is not the God of death, he is the God of fellowship and love, the living God. God does not simply exist, he lives. We know that because he is the God of the Trinity. He lives, he loves himself, he knows himself, he delights in himself as the one true and living God, a life of bliss and blessedness. And therefore he has created man to reflect that life of covenant fellowship which he has within himself and to taste and to know that life. And death is contrary to all of that. Death is the end of life and fellowship and bliss. And death only entered into the world because of man's sin as the just judgment of God upon man's sin. But God is not death. God is life. And murder is an attack, says the Bible, upon man who was made in the image of God. That's Genesis 9, verse 6. Genesis 9, verse 6 says that man was originally made in the image of God, and therefore it is unlawful for any man to murder his neighbor. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. That image of God was lost in the fall into sin and has been corrupted in such a sense that it has now become the image of the devil, but the fact remains that man was made in the image of God, and to kill man is for man to attack God in whose image man was made. It is to attack the crown and the light of God's creation. And God, says Genesis 9, will require that at the hand of the murderer. He will require that because man shall shed the blood of the murderer. The second principle behind the sixth commandment is that murder is not simply in the deed. Murder has a root before it shows its evil fruit. There is a root out of which this murder comes. That's 1 John 3, 15 again. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. There are many people walking on the streets of Limerick this morning, and even sitting in church this morning, who have that murder in their heart, they have that root, that hatred against someone in their heart, but that will never become actual homicide, so that they will have to be put in prison for murder someday. That's not because man is good, it's simply because man is afraid 
afraid to allow that root to become the fruit of actual murder. That is a restraint upon man from the outside. Most people would believe that they would not be able to get away with murder. But if people were told there is a hundred percent guarantee that you will get away with this murder, many people would certainly give it some very careful consideration. Others are afraid of the shame that might come upon them if they were caught in such a vile sin. But it's not because they do not have that desire, it's simply because they are restrained from doing it by other circumstances or considerations. How many of us have wished a person dead? In a moment of anger, have wished that a person would simply drop dead? Or how many of us have looked at someone with such hatred that people would say, if Luke's could kill, that person would have killed his neighbor. And how many of us have said in a moment of anger, drop dead, or words similar to that? Those attitudes which begin in the heart are murderous attitudes. Ill will, a desire to hurt or harm a neighbor, all of that is murder. Sometimes it becomes actual violence. Sometimes a person will actually strike another person in anger. You've gone another step towards actual homicide at that point. And the Heidelberg Catechism therefore tells us that neither in thoughts, nor words, nor gestures, much less in deeds, I dishonor, hit, wound, or kill my neighbor. And this is the way, of course, it was with Cain, as 1 John 3 explains to us. Cain did not immediately go into the field and strike his brother dead. It began in Cain's heart. Cain was wicked. Cain's works were wicked. He brought a wicked, unbelieving sacrifice to God. And Abel's works were righteous because he was a righteous man in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Cain saw that the works of his brother were righteous, and Cain became envious against his brother. He began to fester within with bitterness against his brother. He hated his brother. And so bitter was his hatred and his envy that he could not rest until he had got rid of his brother and hoped by killing his brother that would be the end of the nagging conscience that was exacerbated by the presence of Abel. We must therefore take warning from Cain. That's why he's in the Bible after all. Nip that kind of thing in the bud. Don't allow that hatred and bitterness and envy to grow in your heart and to become bitter words and then bitter deeds and finally actual murder. And this hatred, which is the root of murder, comes in various forms. There's anger, there's envy, there's a desire of revenge. Anger is something that boils within and often over a long period of time simmers and then sometimes suddenly boils over into evil actions, violence. And sometimes it's so violent it leads to actual murder. Envy is a feeling of resentment caused by the success of others. Look what he has. Why do I not have that? What has he done that I have not done to deserve that thing? I want what he has. An envious person can therefore not be happy at the success of another person. 
Rather, he wants what that other person has and wishes him ill in his success. Here's Proverbs 27 verse 4. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Think of Joseph's brothers. Envious because he was given favoritism by his father. He got a special coat. Envious because Joseph had dreams about the future when they would bow down before him and they could not stand it. And the Bible says they could not even speak peaceably unto him. And finally they plotted to kill him and only because they were restrained at the last moment by one of the brothers did they actually sell him into slavery instead, but they would have killed him, killed him. And they hated him so much, they wanted rid of him, never to see him again, sent him off to Egypt, hoping that would be the end of their brother Joseph. Such was their envy. A desire for revenge. A desire to repay someone back for what they have done to us. For a wrong, whether a real wrong or simply a perceived wrong. You can think of Absalom, who nursed his feelings of revenge for years. It looked outwardly that everything was fine between him and his brother Amnon, who had raped his sister Tamar. But he was pretending, and he was plotting, plotting to kill his brother. He did so after years. The sixth commandment, therefore, forbids the deeds which arise out of hatred, envy, feelings of revenge, and anger. It forbids the willful taking away of the life of another human being. The Catechism says that we must not do this by ourselves, by myself. That means I must not be the actual murderer. I must not pull the trigger or plunge the dagger or strike the fatal blow in the act of homicide. We live in a society today where murder and death are glamorized. Life is cheap today. Killing has become so commonplace today that we are hardly even shocked by it any longer. And it's popularized in movies, television programs, and on video games. Some of those games you can play. You can actually play out murdering people. You can get the blood on your screen, as it were. And murder is now thought to be something trivial. And people are murdering today for the most trivial of matters, even as a joke or a bet. And the murderer today no longer fears punishment from the state because the government has become so liberal that there is very little punishment left. A life sentence no longer means a life sentence. People can get out after a few years and go back to murdering again and again. Then there's murdering by another that's using someone else as an instrument of murder. You conceive of the murderous deed, but you do not carry out the murderous deed by your own hand. David, of course, is an example of this in the Bible. He did not actually strike Uriah the Hittite dead with his own hand. He used the sword of the Ammonites, and he used the willing connivance of Joab, his commander. But God came to him and said, You, David, are guilty of murder. You killed Uriah the Hittite. Ahab and Jezebel were also guilty of murder. They plotted and executed the murder of godly Naboth 
he would not sell his vineyard to Ahab. But neither of them actually threw the stones which shed Naboth's blood. Jezebel plotted against Naboth, wrote letters which brought false witnesses against him. And yet Elijah comes to Ahab and says, Yea, hast thou killed, and wilt thou now take possession? God held Ahab responsible for the death of Naboth. And God will hold us responsible too. And holds all those responsible who hire someone else out to kill someone for them. Our modern society is a society of death at both ends of the spectrum. At one end, there is the evil of abortion. And at the other end, there is the evil of euthanasia. Abortion, for all attempts today to sanitize it, is the murder of unborn children. And people know that too. That's why they go out of their way to try and explain it away as much as they can. Scientists know that that child in the womb is a human being. It's not a frog. It's not a fish. It's a human being. And the more we see of the wonders of what happens in the womb, and the more pictures we now have of earlier and earlier, you can see very clearly that that little child is a human being. And so they use words to describe this practice of killing unborn children, such as abortion or termination of a pregnancy. Here's a sentence I found on a website. The termination of pregnancy by the removal or expulsion from the uterus of a fetus or embryo before fetal viability. All big words would simply mean the murder of a baby. That's what it is. And pro-abortion advocates try and argue that abortion is simply the removal of unwanted tissue from the womb of the mother. Something like the removal of a tumor. Or simply getting your appendix removed or your tonsils taken out. And they say too that a woman has the right over her own body and that child, if the woman does not want that child, should be and can be removed from that woman. They call that pro-choice, pro-choice. The fact is most abortions are performed today because the pregnancy was unwanted and the reason for the unwanted pregnancy is fornication. Sex outside of marriage against the seventh commandment leads to the temptation of breaking the sixth commandment to get rid of that neighbor who is now growing in the womb of the mother. And all of the arguments of the abortionists are wicked. God opens the womb. God creates the life of that child in the womb, whether that child be wanted or not. And no one has the right to end the life of that child growing in the womb except God himself. It's not that the mother has sovereign control over her body. God has sovereign control over her body and all bodies. At the other end we have euthanasia. And that word euthanasia comes from the Greek which means good death. Good death. Or there's the other name for it today, mercy killing. A person is old and their life is no longer pleasant as it was when they were younger. 
And perhaps their quality of living is just not very good at all any longer. Or a person is not so old, but a person is terminally ill. They have a terrible disease for which there is no cure. And perhaps they are in a lot of pain because of this disease. The people and their families are now demanding the right to die. The right to die. And they say that human dignity demands that they be allowed to die quickly and painlessly at the moment when they want to die. After all, they say, if a dog is sick and cannot be healed by the vet, you put that dog down out of its misery, should you not do the same for a human being? And so they demand the right for assisted suicide. Some even travel to other countries, such as Switzerland, to get this service. But for all that, it's murder, because it's the killing of another person. You might call it mercy killing. It's not merciful to kill someone. And besides, this system is open to abuse. First you have voluntary euthanasia, where someone says, I'm old, I want to die, Would the doctor please give me an injection so I can die in peace. Or I'm sick, I want to die quicker, I don't want all of this painful medication and painful treatment for many, many years that linger in my bed. But soon it becomes involuntary euthanasia. That's how it usually goes. Persuade your old relatives that really it would be better for them to die soon. And who's behind this? The children who want to get their hands upon the inheritance. And then, of course, the state comes along and says, well, these people are costing us too much money to keep alive. They really have no useful place in society any longer. It would be better for them and for us if we simply ended their lives. But all of that can be answered by this simple consideration. God is sovereign over the life of all people. And we have no right, therefore, to end our lives when we decide they should be ended. We must wait for God in his good pleasure to release us from this life and bring us into death. Another evil is self-harm and suicide. That's also in the Heidelberg Catechism. Also that I hurt not myself, nor willfully expose myself to any danger. We must not, according to this commandment, willfully expose ourselves to danger. That means we should not take foolish and unnecessary risks. There is, of course, necessary risk. Every time you get into a car and drive upon the roads, you are taking a necessary risk. Every time you get into an aeroplane, you are taking a necessary risk. You are not willfully exposing yourself to danger. You are doing something that is necessary to get you from A to B, for example. But to drive recklessly and foolishly at speed or under the influence of alcohol, that would be to take unnecessary risks and willfully to expose yourself to danger. The same thing can be said of those who live for the adrenaline, adrenaline rush, who engage in extreme sports. Some of those things, and you must judge for yourself, some of those things may be lawful, but others are simply exposing yourself to unnecessary risks, willful exposure to danger. Foolish, reckless, dangerous activities simply done for the thrill of it. And of course, suicide is the ultimate expression of this self-harm. It is self-destruction. Suicide means self-murder. 
Homicide is the murder of a human being. Fratricide is the murder of a brother. Patricide is the murder of a father, and so on. Suicide is the murder of one's self. The Bible has nothing good to say about suicide. The only examples in the Bible of suicides are wicked people. Judas Iscariot, Ahithophel, and others. And one who commits suicide rebels against the God of life and says, I am leaving this world. I am, as it were, checking out of this world. I will not submit myself to God's hand, which brings affliction into my life. And it's really the supreme example of selfishness by one who despairs and has no confidence in the goodness of God. We have no right to end our own lives. We have no right to end the lives of anyone else. But not all killing is a violation of the sixth commandment. Crime must be punished. And the civil magistrate has one instrument, according to Romans 13, with which it is to punish crime, that is the sword. And the sword means the death penalty. God has given the civil magistrate, the government, the right and indeed the duty and obligation to inflict the death penalty upon wicked persons. It may not be inflicted by private individuals. You and I have not been given the power of the sword so we can go out and inflict the death penalty upon our wicked neighbours as we see fit. The government has been given that power. And Romans 13 says that the state does not bear the sword in vain. And therefore it is not murder for the state to take that sword, in whatever form it has, electric chair, hanging, whatever form it has, to take that sword and to use it to end the life of a murderer. And remember this, no executed murderer ever re-offends. It's not the job of the government to rehabilitate murderers, to try and improve them, to educate them and so on. It is the job of the government to punish murderers, to be the minister of the wrath of God. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That's what Romans 13 verse 4 says. Murder is also not committed when a person is killed accidentally or in self-defense. Remember, murder originates with hatred or ill will in the heart. A desire to do harm to another person. In the Old Testament, people were killed by accident. Perhaps someone was chopping wood and the head of their axe fell off on top of another person and killed that person. There was no malice forethought, to use a modern legal term. There was no premeditation in that death. That was an accident. And God therefore gave various cities throughout Israel, cities of refuge, where people could flee to escape the relatives of that person who wanted to have revenge. Nor is it murder to kill someone in self-defense. A person has the right to defend himself, his property, and his family. And if in the midst of that defense, reasonable force must be used and the person who is attacking is killed, that person is not guilty of murder. The Bible says his blood shall be upon his own head. That's what the Bible says. Nowadays, of course, you might get into trouble with the civil authorities who did that, but that's what the Bible says. You have the right to defend your property against aggression. It's not enough, however, 
to avoid murder, the actual deed, to avoid hatred, ill will, malice, envy, and anger. There's also the positive call. We are to replace this ill will with goodwill and benevolence, anger and hatred with kindness and love, and envy with genuine joy in another person's good. What shall we therefore do when we are tempted to anger? Show patience, not lash out at others for what they have done to us, not seek to harm them. What shall we do when we see other people prospering and we ourselves are afflicted or we are denied what other people seem to enjoy? We are to have patience recognizing that God's hand is in all of this, and that he has, according to his good pleasure, made this person prosperous, and myself, I am afflicted, and I must therefore be glad, genuinely happy for them. But this, beloved, is the opposite of what we are by nature. By nature, we are selfish. We think we should be first in everything, Anyone who stands in our way is an enemy who must be removed. But this commandment, beloved, comes to those who have been saved by grace. It comes to all men, of course, but especially in this commandment, as set forth in Lord's Day 40, it comes to us, the Christian Church. And we can, by God's grace, keep this commandment. Not perfectly, of course, but we can, by God's grace, keep this commandment. Christ kept this commandment for us. Christ was wronged. No man was more wronged than Jesus Christ. No man was afflicted unjustly more than Jesus Christ. And yet he did not seek revenge. He did not become angry at what other people did to him he forgave them and more importantly he forgave us because we are really because of our sins the source of all of the afflictions and misery that came upon jesus christ he was put to death unjustly by cruel and bloodthirsty men so that he could bear our sins on the cross Really, he was murdered. There was no cause of death found in him. Even Pilate was willing to say that. And yet, he was put to death by the civil magistrate of that day. He is our example, therefore, of how to be patient in adversity and how to be filled with love toward his neighbor. But more than that, he is the power in us to keep this commandment. Christ lives in us by faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and gives us therefore the power to live as He lived, and to love as He loved. Let us therefore, beloved, not hate our neighbor, not murder him, but love him, and protect him, and seek his good, for the sake of Christ, who sought our ultimate good, our eternal salvation. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we confess by nature we are filled with bitterness and malice, hating one another. So we thank thee that thou hast shed thy love abroad in our hearts and caused us to believe in Jesus Christ. We ask the Lord that thou will forgive us our sins that thou wilt cause us to love our neighbors and to keep thy commandments for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.